Okay, so um, today we'll be talking about buildings, and this is continuing the lecture that we uh, did last uh, time on, on Tuesday. So uh, last time we went over some background, we talked about kind of why modeling buildings is difficult, um, all the different kind of physical effects that we need to keep track of, and the many, many parameters you'd need to specify for kind of a detailed physics-based model. Uh, then we talked about simpler models, thermal circuits, and how to get parameters for those. And we wrapped up by starting to talk about higher order, sort of second order and, and above um, thermal circuits. And so we'll start with that today. And then we'll talk about simulating buildings. Um, so basically how to do the time discretization, which now you've done in batteries. It looks very similar to that. Um, but also how to simulate some kind of basic control policies for uh, you know, maintaining the temperature inside of a building, something like that. And then we'll wrap up with an analogy between um, buildings and batteries, looking at buildings kind of as, as heat batteries. Um, something I want to note is that I changed the slides a bit and I added some stuff between last time and today. So if you are still marking up last time's slides, you might want to download the new version. All right. Um, so just to review thermal circuits, there's kind of this analogy between thermal and electrical circuits where um, temperature plays the role of voltage. We have analogs between capacitance and resistance on, on both the thermal side and, and the electrical side. And then um, heat flow or heat transfer basically plays the role of, of current. Okay. So this is a uh, second order uh, called the 2R, 2C circuits because it has two thermal resistances and two thermal capacitances. And uh, we can think of the C here as representing basically the energy storage capacity of say the air and what's called the shallow thermal mass. So um, things like the metal and the ducts and you know, maybe the first centimeter of the surfaces, things that are you know, kind of close to the, the air temperature most of the time. And then this thing CM, this would represent kind of the deeper thermal mass. So the insides of these cinder block walls and things like that. And we can write down basically if we do uh, conservation of charge on this node, we get one differential equation. And then um, I'm just reviewing here, but if we do uh, current balance again on, on this node here, we get a second differential equation. So one governing the air and one governing the mass. And they're coupled, uh, the air temperature shows up in the mass differential equation and the mass temperature shows up in the air differential equation. Um, and again, this is recap from last time, but you can take those two differential equations and you can write them in matrix and vector form. Um, so we put the states on the left-hand side, we have the air temperature and the mass temperature, and we have the time derivative of that on the left-hand side. And then we have a, a continuous time dynamics matrix A times that same state vector uh, plus a, a different matrix B times essentially the inputs. Um, so QC here is the uh, heat transfer that we're getting from say the radiator in the back of the room. And then this W is a disturbance term that includes uh, both the outdoor air temperature um, divided by the thermal resistance, uh, but also, um, I guess I have to find it up here somewhere, right? Um, but also this term QE, which basically represents uh, heat transfer from all sorts of other stuff, things like the sun, body heat, uh, electronics, and, and so forth. And you can write down what those A and B matrices are and, and what this disturbance term W is. And then um, using, I think it was lecture number three, we talked about linear dynamical systems and how to discretize them uh, using the matrix exponential. And so um, we get basically this discrete time version of the continuous time uh, differential equation. Okay, so um, I'll show an example in a few minutes that uses basically this equation here, the discrete time dynamics for this 2R, 2C circuit. Okay, so real quick, um, we talked a little bit last time about how to get the, um, the air capacitance C or the shallow thermal mass capacitance. And also uh, we talked about that uh, parameter R, basically the thermal resistance between the indoor air and, and the outdoor air. Um, and if you look at empirical studies where people you know, look at real buildings and they kind of fit uh, these parameters to, to data and, and see what works, what represents the building reasonably accurately. Um, often we find that uh, the thermal mass capacitance is about an order of magnitude larger than that of the, the air and the shallow thermal mass. And then um, the coupling basically between the indoor air and the thermal mass is usually a little bit stronger uh, than the coupling between the indoor air and the outdoor air. Uh, the reason for that being, you know, um, Basically, interior walls are typically not insulated, whereas exterior walls are. So there's a lot more kind of insulation and impediment to heat transfer between the indoors and, and the outdoors. So, um, so for that reason, we basically divide um, 
the R between the indoors and the outdoors by some number, and it's usually somewhere around six, something like that. And then a sanity check, if you're running these calculations, um, you know, from geometry and material properties and stuff like that of a, of a building, and then you, you get some number for C, you can divide it by, or basically multiply by three, um, and that gives you uh, roughly the equivalent volume of pines. So you can think about, okay, how much wood would it take to get that thermal mass? And what would the dimensions of it be? How much volume would it occupy? Could it even fit inside the building? You know, so you can see, is your math crazy or is it kind of reasonably accurate? Okay, um, so that's kind of the general uh, background on that 2R, 2C model, which is kind of the simplest model that's not first order. Um, so let's talk about basically something called time scale separation or, uh, or two timing. And this is a fairly common uh, move to pull when you're analyzing a differential equation, often with nonlinear ODEs, um, but it actually works pretty interestingly in, in this context. So we'll walk through it. Uh, and it's based on the principle that air temperatures typically change uh, quite, quite a bit faster than uh, the temperatures of the deeper thermal mass. Uh, they have less thermal capacitance, so they're kind of more sensitive to changes in, in like heating output and stuff like that. Uh, and also they have tighter um, coupling typically to, to other things. So, um, so that basically defines two different uh, characteristic timescales. Um, one kind of a faster timescale associated with the air and then a slower timescale associated with um, the thermal mass. And so we make some assumptions, and then we basically get two um, decoupled. Well, no, they're loosely coupled, I guess. But we get two kind of separate um, first-order differential equations that we can, uh, you know, basically do interesting stuff with. So at that faster time scale, we essentially assume that the thermal mass temperature is constant. So in reality, you know, the temperature inside some thick wall is going to be changing, but probably not very much over time. Maybe by half a degree here or there. Um, and then at the slower time scale, we make the assumption that you know now we're thinking of time steps on the order of hours, something like that, and we're thinking about you know the the deeper thermal mass actually being activated by sort of long term but slower heating effects. Um, so point to this, I you know that the indoor temperature. Um, sorry, can I ask folks who are on Zoom just to mute, please? If you have questions, of course, please uh, speak up. Thank you. Um, okay. So let's think about the, the faster time scale, um, where no surprise, basically we'll reduce our model to a 1R, 1C analog. Um, so the idea here is that um, we essentially take out the thermal mass temperature as a function of time and put in a constant thermal mass temperature. And uh, if we do that, now we're in a situation where we basically have one thermal capacitance, so one energy storing element, and then it's connected to two different boundary temperatures, a thermal mass temperature and then the outdoor temperature. And, uh, and those are both kind of exogenous to the ODE. They're not state variables, they're kind of boundary conditions. And so using the math that I showed last time, um, you can convert this uh, basically two boundary temperature thing into a one R1C model with one boundary temperature, sort of an equivalent boundary temperature. And so this may look like something that you did in a homework in like a you know, physics two class, an E&M class back in the day. And the, uh, the thermal resistance associated with that equivalent um, boundary temperature is given by this thing here. It's the product of the hours divided by the sum of the hours. Okay, um, so that's basically the way that we can reduce a 2R2C to a 1R1C at these faster time scales. Um, so thinking about minutes or you know, up to an hour, kind of a time step, shorter time spans. And then if we're thinking about long-term, uh, you know, uh, slower time scales, then we can again look at the uh, mass temperature and basically make the assumption that this T thing is going to uh, adapt instantly uh, to changes and things like the forcing from the sun or from um, mechanical equipment. And so if that's the case, then we can just exactly discretize this equation quite easily. Uh, and we get um, uh, basically a difference equation that describes the evolution of the, the mass temperature here. And uh, you can show that this parameter here, A, uh, that shows up in basically this mixture model. This just says that the new thermal mass temperature is a mixture of the previous uh, thermal mass temperature and the out, or sorry the indoor air temperature. So that thing there, A, is e to the minus delta T divided by the time constant RC for the mass. And then on the air side, we're assuming basically that its time derivative is almost everywhere equal to zero. Um, that when it changes, it basically changes instantaneously. So this is sort of a quasi steady state model. And so if that's the case, then we had our, our governing equation for the air, um, essentially this thing here. Uh, we take the left-hand side and set it equal to zero, and then we solve for T, and we get uh, this equation here. Sorry, we don't solve for T, we solve for Q. Uh, 
um, which gives us essentially the, the heat or the cooling that's being injected or extracted uh, from the space. And so we're assuming basically that this thing here is going to, again, adapt kind of instantaneously um, to, to changing boundary conditions. And I'll show what this stuff looks like in, in a minute. But before I do, I just want to uh, note that you can also write down much more general um, higher order thermal circuit models. So um, for example, if we were modeling, um, I, I don't know, uh, a skyscraper in New York that had 50 stories and each story had you know, 10 different apartments or something like that, we might have 500 thermal zones, uh, 500 air temperature measurements. And then we might have you know, a similar number of thermal mass uh, things. So you might have a thousand states in a model like that. And uh, it might look something like this. If we look at node I, you know, this is apartment number 427 or whatever, um, it has maybe some thermal capacitance associated with it. It may or may not have um, either or both of some mechanical uh, heat, uh, heat transfer from mechanical equipment or uh, heat transfer from exogenous stuff, you know, like the, the sun or whatever. And then it may have connections to other nodes. Um, so this could be adjacent apartments. It could be the outdoors. It could be the ground, uh, things like that. And so you can write down for each node i, um, and there may be, again, a thousand of these, you can write down a differential equation. And then if you want, you could take this thing and you could put it into kind of matrix vector form like we did with the 2R, 2C model. And then you would get sort of a 1,000 dimensional system of linear uh, uh, ordinary differential equations. And the same methods apply. You can take the matrix exponential to write it in discrete time, um, and you can simulate it using the same kind of code. So in this model, the way that I've drawn it here, and there are various ways you can represent these kind of arbitrary NRMC models, um, but I've chosen node zero here to basically be a boundary node. So this could be the outdoor temperature. And then, um, you know, we have a, an equation I um, all the way from one up to N uh, for each of the nodes I. And so this stuff here, you know, um, this pathway basically is coupling between two states in the model, uh, an apartment temperature for N and apartment temperature for I, something like that. And then some of these things can be zero. So if there's no coupling between uh, zone I and another zone J, then the R value there basically would be infinity or one over R would be equal to zero. And so in this governing equation, you would have essentially no term associated with the IJ coupling there. Uh, yeah, I'm right. Like I said, you can kind of use all the same methods, all the same machinery that we talked about for lower order models. Uh, we can use that for um, this kind of arbitrary order models. Okay, so um, I want to talk a little bit about um, kind of simple control policies and then how to plug them in and actually run building simulations. But before I do, um, any questions about what we talked about so far? Or stuff we talked about yesterday or Tuesday? Professor, can I ask you a question? Yes, please. Uh, so I, I'm not sure I might uh, miss something, but uh, how about, for example, if you have multiple zones in the building, so we have multiple nodes representing each zone's air temperature, how can you uh, calculate the temperature distribution, uh, not temperature distribution, but heat flow, flow between these two nodes representing two different zones of air? OK, so if I understand correctly, if we have one of these multi-zone um, models, how could we calculate the heat transfer um, between two zones? Is that right? Yeah, between air to air. Between air to air. OK, so if we look back at this model, and we think of zone I, so you know maybe I is equal to 10 or something. And then N maybe is 100 here. So the heat transfer um, between the air in, uh, in room 10 and the air in room, say, 100 uh, is just given basically by um, the temperature difference, the delta T. So it's essentially it's Ohm's law, but for the thermal circuit. So it's delta T, which is like a change in voltage, a delta V um, in an electrical circuit model, um, divided by R, right? Um, where R is the thermal resistance between, um, say, apartment one and apartment number 100. So if those two things are not adjacent to one another, they, they don't share any surface area, they're decoupled, then this R would essentially be infinite. Um, but if they're right next to each other, there might be, you know, only some, um, you know, plywood or, or um, you know, particle board, or whatever it is, um, drywall, something like that in between two zones. And so there might not be much resistance and there might actually be, you know, a fair amount of heat transfer between them. So is it just kind of like natural convection to calculate that R value? Or we need to know the all the airflow rate and depending on that, maybe we need to use some force convection 
uh, coefficient yeah, are you? So, so you can kind of guess, guesstimate the R um, based on some of the stuff that I presented um, on Tuesday. So, you know, think a little bit about like, is this a thick wall? Is it a thin wall? Is it well insulated? Is it not well insulated? And that would give you essentially a, a U, a thermal transmittance value, you know, maybe order of one watt per uh, degree per square meter. And then um, R would be one over UA, where A is the, the surface area of the, the wall separating the two spaces. So you're, we are not uh, like think, thinking like there is no, uh, there is some air mixing stuff between zones, rooms. Oh, there could, there could be, yeah. So um, so heat transfer by, by basically direct air flowing from one zone to another can be modeled in this network or in this kind of uh, configuration. So um, typically, at least uh, using an ideal gas assumption for the air, the heat transfer associated with mass flow of air would be m dot, the mass flow, times the specific heat of air at constant pressure, times the temperature difference between basically the, the input and the output uh, air streams. So, um, so yeah, you'd have an m dot c delta t. So basically, you, you can write that as a delta t divided by r, where r is 1 over m dot c. So you basically have a time varying thermal resistance to represent that time varying airflow um, between zones. This is getting a little bit in the weeds and it would be easier if I wrote down some equations, but um, does that kind of roughly address your question? Yes, yes, thank you. So I just wanna zoom out a little bit and say that when you start getting into these high order models and taking into account more sophisticated effects, uh, it does get difficult to specify all these parameters. Um, so in practice, what people will often do is they'll specify kind of the, the form of the model using this sort of physical intuition, you know, what zones are connected to what other zones, things like that. But then you fit the parameters of the model using data that you observe um, from the building. So, so often that's an easier approach than actually, you know, a priori specifying all the, the numbers, the R's and the C's. Um, Alex, I think you had a, a question. Uh, no, I think I'm good actually. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, well, yeah, but uh, thank you for speaking up, folks. And, and if you have any questions on Zoom or in the room, please just stop me. Okay, so anything else that we want to check before we dig into the next section here? Okay. All right, so basically to simulate a building, you need not only a way to kind of solve the underlying uh, differential equations, which we have, we know how to do kind of a, a time discretization of a system. And so given an initial state and something like a heat transfer going into a space, we can simulate forward uh, through time. But, uh, but then that kind of raises the question of, well, how do you know how much heat is gonna be squirted into a space, right? So is it gonna be um, decided by some complicated control logic or, are we gonna assume that it's just enough heat to kind of keep uh, the space perfectly at whatever temperature people have specified at the wall thermostat uh, or, or something else? So um, I wanna talk quickly about a couple of those um, policies. And the simplest one is to just assume what's called perfect set point tracking. Um, so here we're assuming that there's some number T hat that we would have access to. And this might just be um, the, the preference of the people who, who reside in the building. And then um, we recall that our 1R1C one one discrete time dynamics, um, so let's think about this in kind of the simple context, is just uh, the new temperature is A times the old temperature plus one minus A times this uh, forcing term here. Okay, so if we want, um, say at the next time step, we're given some temperature here and we wanna place the next temperature exactly at, at the desired temperature, call that T hat at the next time step. Um, basically we plug T hat in for T K plus one here, and then we just solve for, for Q. And that tells us the amount of heat that's needed to drive the temperature in the space from its current value um, to the set point at the next value. So this basically, if you plug in some random initial condition, this will put you exactly at the set point and then kind of keep it there forever. Uh, and we can do that in a 2R2C or, or in fact in a higher order model as well if we want. Um, so if we think about the 2R2C dynamics, um, these are written in discrete time as a matrix A times the state vector T um, plus another matrix B times the, the boundary term. And so we can solve the top equation um, for TK plus one. And uh, sorry, we can plug in uh, T hat again, the, the set point preference for TK plus one. And then we can solve this first equation, the first row of this vector of equations. We can solve that for uh, the input thermal power QC. So you can kind of see how that works. We take T hat over here, we subtract A11 times T, A12 times the mass temperature, and then we have a B1 
times all this stuff. So we divide through by B1 and we end up subtracting off the W over here. Does that make sense? Okay. And then, um, you know, with some hand waving, uh, you can sort of treat higher order thermal circuits uh, similarly, but at least for homework problems and stuff in this class, we probably won't do that. Um, although, you know, in, in applications, you may find that if you're working with a bigger building or, or you know, multi-zone kind of uh, building um, or maybe several buildings that are all kind of coupled somehow, um, then you might need that uh, machinery. But basically, the steps look pretty similar to what I've done. Okay. Um, so that kind of told us how to get, you know, the, the perfect exact amount of heat transfer that would, you know, perfectly match a set point in, in a space. Um, but in practice, uh, heating and cooling equipment basically has uh, constraints on the amount of heat that they can put into or take out of uh, a space. And so we can encode those basically as saying that QC, um, so again, this is the thermal power injected um, by heating equipment, uh, is, is upper bounded and, and lower bounded by you know, a minimum capacity Q min and a max capacity over here. And by the way, um, I've been talking about all this kind of in terms of, of heating, because it's just simpler. We don't have minus uh, signs floating around and stuff. but um, I, you know, a cooling system essentially just withdraws heat from a space. So we would have the same equations that Q here would just be negative rather than positive. Um, so you don't even need to put a minus sign in the equations. They all just work with cooling. Um, but uh, you just need to note that a negative value of QC means heat extraction from the space, so cooling a space. OK, um, so if we want to respect these constraints with our uh, algorithm that kind of tries to perfectly track the set point, you know, but um, can't use an infinite amount of power, um, then basically we do what's called saturation. Um, and this is, I think, a term that dates back to people who control chemical processes or something like that. But um, uh, it has to do with like, you know, if you're stirring something into like some salt into some water, right? You're stirring it in and eventually it hits saturation. And then if you add more, it, it doesn't uh, increase the salinity of the mixture anymore. It just kind of uh, percolates down the bottom or whatever, precipitates out to the bottom. Anyway, um, so you can think of this as like, you know, you're adding salt, the saltiness is increasing. And then at some point the water is saturated and, and it stops, even if you add more salt. That's kind of, I think, where the saturation frame uh, comes from. But anyway, so this basically says that the actual um, heat that you're ejecting or, or removing from the space is, um, is equal to the Q hat that we had from the last slide. So this is uh, the heat transfer that's needed to exactly uh, track the set point. But then it's saturated above by the maximum capacity and saturated below by the minimum capacity. So if you're in this range, it's kind of a one-to-one -one mapping, but above here and, and below here, it's limited. Does that make sense? Okay, so um, so that's a way to simulate stuff. It's not really um, a way to control stuff in reality because um, you know we may not have access to all of these numbers and, and stuff like that. Um, so in in reality, uh, the way that very many, uh, not all, but but many uh, heating and cooling uh, equipment systems are, are controlled is using what's called thermostatic control. This is why we call that widget on the wall over there a thermostat. Um, so static just means kind of constant, right? Stasis means no change. And then there was heat, obviously. So this is sort of keeping temperature constant control. Um, and it applies to things that are operated um, in an on-off fashion. So, um, so like a lot of fans and compressors and pumps and things like that will either be running at their maximum capacity or shut off completely. Uh, more sophisticated machines will have variable speed drives on them and it can kind of continuously modulate their output. Um, but this thermostatic control only applies to the on-off equipment out there, which is probably 80 to 90% of all the HVAC equipment that's in the world. Um, okay. So uh, a basic sketch of how thermostatic control logic works is um, we're assuming that we have some, some action here and, and this symbol U kind of harks back to what we talked about with um, uh, linear dynamical systems, right? So U we think of as an action that we're taking or a knob that we twiddle. Um, so here it's either zero or one, and it basically is the on-off state of the equipment. And then in thermostatic control, we specify what's called a dead band, um, and it's in units of, of degrees. So this thing is actually the half width um, of a, a band of temperatures. So like if the wall thermostat says 72, um, then T hat, the preference here would be 72, and then delta might be one. So then we'd say we're going to try to control the temperatures within a band between 71 and 73. Yes. All right, so the logic goes like this. Um, at each time step, we start by um, just doing what we were going to do previously. And then we say, um, and this is in a heating example, we say if the actual temperature T, the thing we measure, is above uh, the preference plus this dead band delta, 
uh, then we turn it off. We turn off the heating equipment. And conversely, if we're below uh, T hat minus delta, so we're below, say, 71 Fahrenheit, uh, then we turn on, right? Then we know that the space is getting cold, so we need more heat. And uh, so in between there, you basically do nothing. You just do what you were doing in the previous time step. And then, um, so here, you know, in, in simulation, we would do this. We would set the output, the thermal power output of the equipment equal to uh, its minimum capacity plus U times the difference between its maximum and its minimum capacity. So this is uh, whatever, kind of a complicated formula, but basically you could plug in U equals zero and you see, okay, the thing is off. So then we're just running at min capacity, um, which is probably zero uh, here. Uh, or what's on, uh, if u is equal to one, then the, the q mins would cancel here, the plus and minus, and we'd just be left with the maximum capacity. So this is kind of doing a bang, bang control thing between the, the maximum and, and the minimum allowable. Yeah, a question. Good, um, I'm not sure where you mentioned that it's only pertaining to heating the, you know, I mean, for cooling, okay. Yeah, that's, so the question is, does this only pertain to heating or does it work for cooling as well? Um, so it does work for cooling as well. You would just have basically sign changes. Um, so here we would say if you're above, then we turn on. We set u equal to one if we're doing cooling, right? And then uh, and then if we were below, we would set u equal to zero essentially. And then in simulation, we would say okay, uh, increment k. So add one to to k, and then upgrade t using the dynamics equation, and then we just repeat this control logic a bunch of times. So it's very simple. It's just kind of if then type logic, and it can simulate super quickly. And here's a sketch of what that looks like. So in the middle here, um, I haven't drawn it, but this would be the preference kind of right in the middle of a dead band. So this would be our RT hat. And then um, I've drawn you know, the magenta kind of dashed lines here are the limits uh, that we don't want to go above or below. So down here, the heat is on. We're driving the temperature up in the space. Eventually, we exceed the upper limit. And then we turn off. And we do kind of a, a drift for a while. And then eventually we get too cold in the space and we turn on again and uh, we go up. So um, so the ratio of the time that we spend on to the, the total time in one cycle is called the, the duty cycle. Um, and it's a common term that you look at. It's a percentage between zero and, and 100%. Um, so on a really, really cold day, a piece of on-off equipment might be operating close to 100% duty cycle. So it would stay on for a very long time and then it might turn off, but only for a minute or two and then it might turn on again. And you can kind of hear this if you live in a house with a furnace or something like that on a really cold day. Um, the runtime is usually very long. And uh, if it's really mild outside, it's like 50 Fahrenheit or something, you might have a very short duty cycle. So you might have, you know, just be on for a little while and then drift for a, a long time, an hour or something like that. Okay, so, um, so that is thermostatic control. Again, a super common algorithm for thermal systems. Um, so I'm gonna uh, show an example here. Uh, and I'm going to basically be comparing the 2R2C model, the kind of full model that we described, um, with the 1R1C models that we got uh, from the kind of two timing uh, approximations. So I'm looking at a, a two story house with a floor area of about 200 square meters. This is a very typical um, you know, setup for you know, kind of a normal ish American house, a single family house. And then I'm simulating over five days uh, in 2022 from, uh, from West Lafayette here. So you may remember that the, the last you know, week of 2022 was super cold. Um, we had a, a polar vortex event and it got down to like negative 10 Fahrenheit, negative 25 Celsius, whatever that is. Um, so I don't know, it just makes the simulations a little more interesting because it's kind of an extreme case. So here uh, I'm plotting, uh, both of these have time on the x-axis and on the y-axis, this is the outdoor temperature. So you can see in the 22nd, it was not too bad, right around freezing. And then we had a really sudden drop uh, on the 23rd until it was bitter cold, uh, basically midday on the 23rd. And then uh, it got a little bit warmer over time there. And then this thing here, uh, the exogenous thermal power, this is that thing QE, which includes, it's kind of a catch-all, right? Includes body heat, uh, heat from lights and electronics and the sun and stuff like that. And so these uh, spikes that you see here is basically the sun you know, being out. And so we're getting some free heat from that during the day. Yes, question. So that's exogenous power term. Are you simulating that or is that a measured signal? Yeah, so where am I getting this data from, this wiggly, noisy looking thing? Um, am I simulating it or is it a, a measurement, like say from your house? Um, so this is just simulated. Uh, so I think what I did here is I took about uh, roughly a kilowatt and I added some random noise to it to you know, correspond to electronics and networking equipment and things like that. 
And then I added in, I, I took real solar data. Um, so this is real weather data and I took real solar data uh, for the same time span. And then I kind of rescaled it a little bit and, and added it in here to give, um, again, this is not perfectly accurate, but at least it gives a semblance of, of accuracy. Yeah, rough kind of thing, exactly. Um, yeah, no, no problem. Okay, so here's what the exact simulation results uh, show here for the full 2R2C model. And, um, and I'm using, again, the sort of perfect set point tracking thing, but with the recognition that, um, say, a, heat, a heating system for a house would have, can't go, you know, basically can't switch into cooling mode, so it can't go below zero, uh, and it usually has a limited capacity, you know, 60,000 BTUs or, you know, 15 kW thermal or something like that, so. Um, okay, so that's what I'm simulating here. And uh, and the dashed line here, the magenta, I think you can see is the, this is the preference, the T hat that I showed earlier. So um, here the time span is on the x-axis and you can see we're going for five days, which is 120 hours. So overnight, the set point is a little lower. And then during the day, I don't know, people are home and active and they wanna be a little toastier uh, and then it drops down at night again. So, um, so the bottom plot here is the, the thermal power. Oh, sorry, and the black up here is the, the air temperature measurement, which is tracking pretty well the set point, but, but can't always keep up with the set point, in particular in these morning periods when we jump uh, a couple of degrees. Uh, it takes a little while, basically, for the heating system to warm the house back up uh, in the mornings. Okay, and then the, the red here is the thermal mass temperature. So you can see it's doing kind of a, a periodic, almost a sinusoidal sort of a thing. And then the bottom plot, this is the thermal power that's being injected by the heating system into the house. So you can see uh, in this morning period, when we go from low uh, to high temperature, we basically cap out. We use sort of all the, the capacity that we have in the heating plant. Um, and we can't quite get the temperature all the way up to, uh, to the set point or whatever it is, 21. Um, but we get pretty close. So there's only a little, a little delay here. But as it gets colder and colder outside, those morning delays get longer and longer, basically because uh, it's harder and harder to, to keep up with uh, with that big jump, that step change in, in temperature. And then you can also see in the, in the evening periods when we drop the set point by a couple of degrees, basically we can turn off the heating system for a little bit, for you know 15 minutes or something like that. And then it kind of slowly turns back on and the load, the heating load overnight is a little bit lower um, than it is during the day because we have a lower temperature set. So does that basic pattern kind of make sense here? Okay. So now I'll show um, what the, the sort of approximate model, the, the fast 1R, 1C model looks like. And so here um, I'm showing the same plots, but uh, now uh, kind of when I'm doing the simulation in, in MATLAB, I'm assuming just a constant um, thermal mass temperature. And I just set it to be the average of the, the air temperature set points um, over the whole time span. So it's a little closer, you can see, to the, the daytime temperature than it is to the nighttime temperature. And that's because uh, when we do the time average of this square wave thing, uh, it, it's a, a little closer to the daytime because we, uh, the daytime set point rather, because we spend more time up there than we do uh, at, at the low set point. Okay, so previous one, the, the mass was dynamic. Here we're assuming, eh, you know, let's just treat it as constant, kind of at this average value. And uh, if we do that, you can see what the thermal power signal looks like in the bottom plot. Um, I'm just going to flip between these quickly so you can see that it's not identical, but it looks very similar. So the basic trend, the basic pattern is, is pretty much unchanged. And then if we calculate the error um, between uh, the approximate black curve here and the, and the actual, you know, from the true 2R2C model here, um, the MAE, which stands for mean absolute error. So you take the absolute value, basically, of the, the difference between the two curves and then you average that absolute value over time. Uh, it ends up being 0.36 kilowatts. And the mean of this thing is like, you know, six kilowatts. So that's, I don't know, whatever that is, 5% error or something like that. Less, less than that, I guess. Um, anyway, uh, so that's pretty good. And then if you look at the integral of this thing, the energy error, so suppose that we were trying to use this model to estimate how much people were gonna have to pay for their heating bills for the month or for this week. Um, the estimate there is, is quite good as well. So we're within about 1% uh, when we estimate the error under these curves. Okay, so that's the kind of fast time scale model where we assume the, the thermal mass temperature is constant. So let's look at the other one where um, basically we assume kind of slower dynamics and, and we think about the changes on the, the thermal mass temperature 
uh, and then we assume that the air temperature responds instantly to whatever the heating uh, the boundary conditions are doing. So here we, um, so now, okay, let's see. I took the exact sort of measurement. The, the black curve here on the top plot is exactly the same as it was in the 2R2C model. The idea here is that this is something you could just measure from a thermostat. So that's the same. And then I'm simulating the evolution of the, the red thing here. And uh, it turns out that that ends up being pretty much exactly the same as the first one too. So in terms of temperatures, we're basically spot on. But then we're making this assumption essentially that the, the air has no capacitance associated with it. So it responds instantly to changes. And so for that reason, we get kind of an interesting effect down here, which is that the big peaks, both in the morning and in the evening, the, the sort of upward peak and then the downward trough, that those kind of get scrubbed out of the, of the data. So if we flip back and forth, we can see there are these troughs and it's just gone. And then the spike in the morning is also gone. Um, and that's, I guess, the effect of kind of assuming that there's no thermal capacitance associated with the air and the shallow thermal mass. Okay, so for that reason, the, the air uh, between this signal and, and the, the one that has the spikes in it is bigger. It's about twice what it was for the, the um, fast time scale model. Uh, the energy error is actually smaller. <laughs> and I think the reason there is we get kind of lucky because we have errors upward when we, uh, when we miss the, the morning spikes, but we also have kind of downward errors when we miss the, the evening spikes and, and those are or troughs rather. And those basically average out over time. Okay, so the point here is basically um, first order models of buildings can actually be very powerful and reasonably accurate. And they can match higher order models reasonably well too. So we learned about how you can take an NR1C model, right, a building, so one room that has connections to N boundary temperatures or boundary zones, um, that you can write that exactly as a 1R1C model with an equivalent resistance and an equivalent boundary temperature. Okay, so in that sense, the 1R1C model is very general. And then we've also said, okay, what if there are thermal mass effects here, like in this 2R2C thing? And we've shown two ways that you can basically simplify that down to a 1R1C model and get quite accurate um, predictions of things like energy use. Okay. Yeah, question. So, so, this so the fast 1R1C, you're assuming no capacitance. Uh, so the question is, am I assuming no capacitance in the thermal mass for the fast model? Um, so, so I guess the assumption there would actually be that it has infinite thermal capacitance. So, um, so the more capacitance, so if we look back here, so suppose that, um, and we could run these simulations in, in MATLAB, right? But I don't have it open right now. But um, suppose we took the, the thermal mass value, the CM, in this 2R2C simulation, and we just started increasing it and increasing it. We would see that basically the amplitude of, of this um, you know, periodic signal here would, would be attenuated. So it would get uh, narrower and narrower, right? And in the limit that C for the mass goes to infinity, you basically get a, a flat signal like this. Okay. So it's like, no matter how much heat you put into the walls, they stay the same temperature. That's basically the same as the, the, the underlying assumption. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then second question. Yeah. Um, so these values, you're, you're doing a model on, on top of the house model, where are you drawing the internal mass and air temperature? So um, where where in these simulations am I getting the, the internal mass and, and temperatures from? Um, so here I have um, I have specified the parameters in the model. So the, the full 2R2C model. Yeah. Um, that's kind of my, my ground truth, right? So I took basically this thing. I specified the Rs and the Cs. And then I built these matrices, and then I did the discrete time thing, and then I used basically this equation to simulate. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and when I'm simulating this, so the W is fully specified, it's like just weather data and stuff, mm -hmm. but the QC is not. And so I'm calculating that QC by basically backing out what I would need in order to perfectly track the set point. And I did that using this equation. Makes sense, and then um, and then I saturated it using this equation here. I guess that question is kind of really cool. I was just like in the sense of where you draw the energy error from. Oh yeah, so so where like I do these error calculations, yeah. right? So what is the the ground truth that I'm benchmarking against? Yeah. So the two R two C with like the full matrix simulation, right? That I'm considering ground truth. So, so I'm, I'm not comparing to the DC house or to an energy okay. plus model or to some nonlinear sophisticated thing. I'm just, it's just a, a second order model versus the first order models is the comparison here and the error between them. Exactly. Okay. 
So, so there's another notion of error, which would be how well does this thing here, the 2R, 2C, represent reality, yeah. right? And there, the errors could be significant. They could be quite significant, right? Um, although, you know, for good choices of the disturbances and the parameters, maybe not so significant. Okay. But, okay. Yeah, so it's just kind of within the, like, stuff that lives on my computer only, like abstracted from reality. If we just have these mathematical models, how well do they approximate each other? Okay. Yeah, good, good question. Thank you. Okay, um, so we have about half an hour left. Uh, so I guess in the end here, I wanna talk about an analogy um, between buildings and batteries. Uh, the idea being that we've talked about how things like the air, the thermal mass of a building can be viewed as energy storing things like kind of capacitors, but for heat. And, uh, and so it turns out that that analogy um, is pretty good actually, and, and you can make it kind of formal and treat uh, buildings as sort of electrothermal energy storage in the same sense that uh, batteries are electrochemical energy storage. They take electricity, store it as chemistry, uh, chemistry <laughs> store it as chemical potential energy, and then convert it back basically. Um, okay, so uh, so here's a reminder of a battery model. You guys have been working on battery stuff for homework this week, so this is hopefully top of mind for you all. Here I've written it a little bit differently from the way that I presented it in the, the batteries and the EVs lecture, but it's it's very close. So the dynamics are the same. Uh, we have X is the, the stored energy in the battery, uh, and this would be chemical potential energy for uh, like a lithium ion battery. So the state here uh, satisfies a first order linear differential equation where we have minus X divided by tau. Uh, tau is the self-dissipation time constant. Uh, and for a battery, that might be like a thousand hours or more. And then P chem, this is the, the chemical charging power. And there would be a conversion basically between the electrical um, power pulled from say the power grid and the chemical power that makes it into the battery. And you might have a conversion efficiency there of like 95% or something like that. But I'm just talking about the chemical energy here. Um, in the same way, I'll only talk about the thermal energy um, in the, the building's analogy. Um, okay. And then I think when I presented batteries, I had a, a zero as the lower bound for energy. Um, but for buildings, you end up kind of having sort of a, a negative and, and a positive energy capacity. So it's just easier to put in kind of an, an X min and an X max here. And then uh, chemical charging power would have basically a, a discharging and, and a charging capacity as well. So for, you know, like a, a Tesla power wall, um, it might have an energy capacity. So the little guy would be zero here and, and the upper limit on the energy would be 13 and a half kilowatt hours. Um, and then the charging and the discharging capacities are around five kilowatts for, uh, and this is like a, a popular home battery, right? By the way, it costs like, like somewhere around 12 to $15,000 to get a, a Tesla Powerwall put into your house. <laughs> so um, not for the faint of heart, but it can be valuable in some places when you kind of couple solar with the battery and, and you can use your solar yourself and overnight and stuff like that. So we'll get more into those details when we learn about solar and then later on in, in the semester. Okay, so let's talk about this analogy. Basically, how can we think of either the air or the thermal mass in a building as, as like a battery, but for heat? Um, so let's look at the fast time scale model and just think about the, the air specifically. So here we have, again, this first order linear ODE. It has some boundary temperature theta and some um, equivalent resistance R. And then we have the injected heat from mechanical equipment and then the stuff, do you have anything else? Heat transfer. Okay, so let's define um, some nominal values, T hat and, and Q hat. And these could have basically the same interpretations that they had in, in that last example. So T hat could just be the, the number that the wall thermostat says, and Q hat could basically just be the amount of heat that's needed to keep the building exactly at that desired temperature. So, um, so let's assume basically that, you know, in that kind of nominal or baseline case, that um, these things, which would be functions of time, uh, that those functions satisfy the differential equation. And with the same boundary conditions, the same parameters and stuff like that, that we have um, for the, the true temperature, which has no, no hat on it. That's the thing that we would measure like with a thermometer. Okay, and then we define thermal energy, which is just the capacitance, which would have units of like kilowatt hours per degree. And we multiply that by um, the difference essentially between the measured temperature T and the nominal or baseline temperature T hat. So like if that thing says 72 and we heated the, the room up to 74, we would be storing, you know, two degrees times the thermal capacitance of this room, uh, that much energy in, in the air, basically. 
Okay, so then we can write down a differential equation um, for x. You know, it's a function of t and t hat, and we have an equation for t and another equation for t hat. So we can just write those down. Um, and it turns out if you take this top thing here and you subtract this bottom thing here, um, you get this thing down here. So we get a t hat minus a t. So up here we have the negative t, and then we're sub subtracting a minus t hat. So that gives us a plus t hat. And those both are divided by r. The thetas cancel. And the QEs also cancel. So then on the right-hand side, we just have our, our QC minus QC hat. So the interpretation here is this is like um, the amount of power. So suppose we're, we're kind of perturbing the building away from its normal operations. So normally we would, uh, you know, you'd be using energy Q hat uh, to heat the space, but, you know, maybe we're heating more than we need to to store energy in, in the building. So then QC would be bigger than QC hat. So far, so good. Okay, so then the last line here is just to notice that t hat minus t, well, that's negative x uh, divided by c. So we just take this definition of the energy and we plug it in uh, here, and we do a little tiny bit of algebra, and we get essentially a battery equation. So we get dx dt on the left-hand side, negative x divided by a thing with units of time. So this is the time constant on the right-hand side, rc, um, plus a thing that we're going to define as basically the thermal power thermal charging power if it's positive, or the discharging power if it's negative. So just basically some algebra and, and a clever definition of an energy, and, and then we get um, basically a, a battery equation. So you may remember that we, uh, in a battery lecture, I know this was a week ago or something like that, but we went through basically how to, you know, what are the parameters in a battery model and, and how do we specify them? So we can do that same thing here with the heat battery model of a, a building. Um, but I guess let me just show a, a sketch quickly of the kind of thing that I'm talking about and, and what all these different um, numbers mean. So um, so T hat here, again, this is the, the preference. So I'm uh, saying maybe this is a residential building. And so I'm kind of zoomed in, but maybe this would be something like 70 Fahrenheit or, or 68 as a nighttime set point. Um, so a lot of people, not everybody, but a lot of people will do this is drop the uh, heating set point overnight. Maybe they like to sleep a little bit cooler, or maybe they just want to save energy overnight. And then during the day, maybe they'll, they'll bump it up, something like this. So the, the pink here is the preference. And then the blue dashed lines um, are basically the same things that showed up like in the, in the thermostat uh, illustration. So these are the limits that you want to keep the temperature in between. Um, and we can think of that as basically giving some flexibility, some energy storage capability um, to the building. So we might say, look, yeah, the number over there on the thermostat says 72, but would I really even notice a difference if it was at 73 or at 71? maybe even 74 or 70, you know? Um, humans aren't typically that sensitive to, to temperatures. Changing temperatures we're pretty sensitive to, but knowing the absolute number is like pretty, pretty tough. And then maybe that band, right, uh, is a little bit bigger overnight. So if I'm asleep or covered in blankets, like I might not notice even a four degree Fahrenheit temperature swing. So that this band can be, uh, can be bigger as well. Okay, and then the black is just the measurement here. So you could think of, I don't know, doing some kind of smart control thing here, which would basically be, if we view this as a battery, we'd be sort of discharging the battery overnight for some reason. I don't know, maybe there's something else happening. I don't know, electricity is expensive because everybody's heating with electricity or something overnight. And then um, and then during the day, I don't know, for some reason we're sort of charging the battery over overheating the space to store energy in. And then maybe over here, uh, electricity is gonna get really expensive again. And so we begin to discharge the battery here. Does that kind of make sense, the, the analogy? Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, so um, the energy capacity then we can define essentially in terms of those temperature constraints. So you can imagine like if um, if I'm very sensitive to temperature changes and I, I say, um, uh, Levi, you're gonna control my house, um, but just make sure that you keep it within one degree Fahrenheit plus or minus of my set point. That, that's like my house is then going to be a pretty small battery because I'm only tolerating a, a small change in temperature. Um, but if someone else is like, ah, oh, yeah, I don't really mind. I really want to save money, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, whatever it is, they might tolerate, you know, plus or minus two or plus or minus three degree swings. And then so if Levi is a startup who is doing kind of, you know, thermal battery stuff and selling that service somehow to a utility or whatever, uh, he would be able to make essentially more money off of uh, someone who has a less strict, uh, you know, tolerance for temperature swings. Anyway, so um, so we specify that those minimum and maximum things might be a degree or two above the, the preference. 
And then, um, yeah, right. This was just our definition of the, the thermal energy. It's basically the measured temperature minus the preference. And so if we just take these uh, constraints up here, these inequalities, we multiply by C on both sides, and then we subtract by basically C times T hat. Um, then we get the left-hand side here and the right-hand side here. And so that looks just like the battery uh, constraint on the energy that showed up here with one subtle difference, which is that here, these things are potentially time variant. So the set point is, is definitely, well, is very likely to be time varying. People often change the set point throughout the day, but actually even the band around the, the set point could be time varying too. So again, I could tolerate bigger swings overnight than during the day, something like that. Okay, so just running some numbers here. So uh, a typical value again for like a 2000 square foot house that's a couple of stories might be about two and a half, three, something like that for the thermal capacitance. And then maybe we tolerate around, um, you know, plus or minus one degree Celsius, roughly two degrees Fahrenheit. So uh, with those parameters, we would get that the difference basically between the minimum energy and the maximum energy that we can store um, would be about five kilowatt hours. Something. So I mentioned that a Tesla uh, power wall stores 13 and a half kilowatt hours and it might cost you know, 10 to $15,000 somewhere in there to install on your house. So um, here we have like one third the energy storage uh, capacity and it basically is for free as long as you tolerate a little bit of temperatures wiggling around in your house, I guess. Uh, I should note though that the power wall basically, you know, it stores electricity more or less. You put electricity in, you get electricity back out. Um, with the thermal storage up here, it's uh, not so clear. Like basically you put in electricity, but you get out heat or something. So we're storing thermal energy rather than essentially electrical energy. And so there's less value basically to that. I'll talk about that in, in more detail in a second. Okay. Um, and we can do the same thing with the power capacities. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, a few slides back, um, any uh, air conditioner or furnace or heat pump or whatever is gonna have a limited capacity uh, to produce or, or extract heat. And so those we can write again as linear uh, inequality constraints. And then uh, if we define the thermal power here, so this um, QC minus Q hat is what showed up in the battery model, the differential equation that we wrote down. So this is what we defined essentially as our thermal power, uh, analogous to the chemical charging power that you would have in a battery. So again, if we want a constraint on that thing, well, P therm is just Q minus Q hat. So if we subtract a Q hat from the left-hand side and the right-hand side, then we get a, a constraint on, on the thermal power. Okay, so here I put a negative sign here in this definition. Um, so the discharging thermal power will be Q hat minus Q minimum. Um, and these things again are, are potentially time varying um, because you know um, depending on the weather outside, it may take less or more um, heat to keep uh, a building exactly at, at the set point temperature. Um, so if we're on a really cold day, we might be very close to our maximum capacity and not have much basically upward flexibility. But if it's a really mild day, we might be close to minimum capacity and, and we might have a lot of sort of upward flexibility, but not very much kind of downward flexibility because maybe the furnace is only running at say 30% uh, duty cycle or capacity, something like that. Okay, so uh, what's a, a reasonable number for this? Um, well, for a Tesla power wall, you have typically somewhere around five kilowatts, both for charging and, and for discharging. So you add those together, you get about 10 kW as like the range. You can go from negative five all the way up to plus five. And so for a typical house in the US, you might find um, a range on the thermal side of kind of somewhere in the 10 to 15 um, kW as well. Um, so we're kind of similar, but again, now we're kind of more or less talking thermal power rather than electric power. So again, we have to think about kind of the conversions there. And we'll talk more about that uh, in a couple of slides and also um, to our, our next lecture when we talk about um, heating and, and cooling equipment. Okay, um, so questions about that analogy? All right, um, so we can do the same thing, basically thinking of thermal mass. Um, and again, we'd be thinking kind of at slower time scales, right, where you, um, you know, keep the, the building warm for a long time so that we not only heat up the air uh, in the building, but also begin to sort of charge up, warm up all the all the cinder blocks and, and the wood and stuff like that that makes up the fabric of the building. 
So in our slow model, the, the approximation to our 2R2C model that we had uh, at the slow time scale, we had this differential equation here. Um, C mass times the time derivative of the, the mass temperature was just equal to this very simple thing, a delta T on R on the, the right-hand side. Okay, so we play the same game. We say, oh, look, under nominal kind of normal conditions, baseline conditions, uh, the indoor temperature would be at some you know, set point or whatever, T hat. And uh, the mass, therefore, you know, it's basically driven only by the indoor temperature, so it it uh, would be fixed at some value T mass hat. And then those two would satisfy the underlying um, differential equation that, that governs the heat transfer and, and temperature uh, in the building. And so we would have the hats basically in the same equation. So now same move that we did with the air, basically just subtract the top equation uh, from the bottom, or the bottom from the top, rather. And we define the energy stored in the thermal mass as just its capacitance times the difference between its actual measured temperature, Tm, and then what the temperature would have been kind of in a baseline or a nominal scenario, T hat. So same game. Uh, take this guy, subtract it from this guy. And then we note that this thing in parentheses here is just equal to this thing up here with a minus sign divided by Cm. So that's negative x divided by C. So we uh, note that there's a, an R here as well that gives us one term minus X divided by RC and that RC has units of time again. So this is a time constant associated with the mass. And then um, we have the driving term, essentially the thermal power term, which is actually the air temperature, the difference between it and um, you know, the set point divided by RM, which is the coupling strength essentially between the, the indoor air and the thermal. So the basic idea in this model is in order to charge this battery, we raise the indoor air temperature. So first we heat up the air, we store some heat in the air, raise its temperature, and then we hold it at a higher temperature for a long time. And we start to basically bleed heat from the air into the fabric of the building. Make sense? Okay. Okay, so we can play the same game as well with the energy capacity and, and with the, the power capacities of, of this battery. Um, so suppose that we have some temperature constraints and these could be you know, from comfort, like people don't wanna to touch a really hot wall, um, but they could also just come from, from physics. Basically, um, since we're using the air temperature as sort of the lever, the knob uh, that the, the cranks heat basically into the thermal mass, we're not gonna be able to get the mass to a higher temperature than, than the air. So if uh, it could just be that this, these lower limits and, and upper limit for the mass temperatures are just equal to those for the, the air temperatures. But in general, they could be something else. So I've left it here kind of to, to keep it uh, general. Okay, so this is the thermal energy definition. And again, so we do the same game. Basically, we multiply by C and we subtract off the, the preference T hat on uh, the left-hand side and the right-hand side of these inequalities here. And then uh, and we, we define the thing that shows up on the left and on the right as the, the minimum and the, and the maximum energy for the battery. And again, these things are, are time varying uh, potentially because the, the preference here could be time varying, you know, if we have a, a day and a night set point, something like that. Okay, and then we run the numbers and we find the difference between these two, kind of the, the, the amount, the magnitude of energy that we can store um, for a typical house might be around 50 kilowatt hours. So this is um, an order of magnitude larger than what we had um, for, you know, the, the amount of heat that we can store in the air. So as long as you um, have had the time uh, to do this kind of slower time scale charging of the fabric of a building, it can actually have quite a lot of energy storage um, capacity. And we can run the same thing for the power capacity. Again, the kind of lever that we're using to do the charging is the indoor temperature itself here. So that has limits. Um, so therefore the thermal power um, has some limits as well. We take the inequalities, uh, subtract T hat and divide by RM and we get the limits on the thermal power. So that's our, our discharging and our charging power capacities. And if we add those up for a typical building, now we're kind of on the order of about four kilowatts. Um, and for the air battery, it was on the order of like 10 kilowatts, but um, with maybe five, kilo, five kilowatt hours, something like that of storage. So it was small energy capacity, but higher power capacity. And then the, the mass battery ends up with basically a really large energy capacity but it's slow to charge. It has a small power capacity. Is this cool? I think this stuff is so cool. Are you guys totally bored by this or do you think it's cool? 
it's like just the idea there's like 100 million houses in, in america and you can think of all of them as like a battery i think it's cool yeah so, so is this the way that people are like willing to sit at some just a much higher temperature for some period of time so the question is um is this kind of assuming that people are willing to sit with a much higher temperature over time um yeah but but not much it doesn't have to be much right so it turns out that actually quite small changes in temperatures, um, if you hold them long enough, can lead to a lot of energy storage, right? Even just a degree, if you're multiplying it, multiplying it by a thermal capacitance of um, whatever it is for a house, I guess, 25 kilowatt hours per degree, right? 25 kilowatt hours, that's like two $15,000 batteries, <laughs> right? So somehow it's like, I don't know, if I, I'm willing to accept plus or minus one degree, um, I don't know, like that's, you get a fair amount of energy storage out of it, but it is slow because of the, the limit of, uh, on the power capacity, basically. Um, so so there are kind of two things that people use thermal mass effects like this for, um, and I'll kind of, we'll get into this in much more detail later in the semester. Um, but one is is providing sort of fast time scale services. Um, so, so one thing that, uh, that people sell basically and, and can make money off of in wholesale, so big picture bulk um, power grid markets is a service called frequency regulation. So without going into too much detail, the basic task of operating a power grid reliably is to keep supply and demand matched at all times. Um, and if they begin to, to mismatch, so if your um, supply begins to drop a little bit below your demand, then the frequency on the grid will begin to drop. Um, so frequency just means like, you know, cycles per second of the um, oscillating, you know, AC waveform, um, which is 60 hertz in the US and 50 hertz in Europe or whatever. Um, okay, so some generator fails and then that nominal 60 hertz that all our electronics want begins to sag and it drops to 59.8, 59.6, something like that. So then the people who are providing frequency regulation, they're basically, they can measure frequency locally and they can say, oh, something must be wrong with the grid. Uh, we lost a generator somewhere. I better ramp up my own generation if they're a supplier or ramp down my own demand if they're, say, a building, right? And uh, and typically, the durations of those kind of ramp up, ramp down events are very short, like on the order of minutes. So um, if you're doing something fast like that, using the, the fast battery in a building, um, so the air temperature um, is kind of, kind of makes sense. And those signals tend to be sort of zero mean over time. So the grid is always kind of sloshing around, you know, it's 59.9, 60.1 or whatever it is. And so you're kind of ramping up as much as you're ramping down. And so the temperature signal just kind of looks like noise around the, the set point, which is kind of what temperature looks like anyway. If we're doing thermostatic control, we see this kind of zigzag thing um, with, you know, sort of a period on the order of maybe 15 minutes or something like that. So it's like totally normal and it's basically imperceptible is the argument. <laughs> Whether it is or not, I mean, that's kind of up to the building occupant. We'll see, but um, but yeah, so that's one thing uh, is providing these fast time scale services for reliability purposes. Um, and then another thing is um, kind of on, on much slower time scales. Uh, so some people, yeah, actually most people in, in a residential setting have a, a flat electricity price. So you pay the same price per kilowatt hour of electricity in the night, in the day, in the summer, in the winter. But um, some people have what are called time of use rate plans, where there might be a lower price, say, overnight, higher price during the day, something like that. And most commercial buildings, like I'm sure Purdue pays a time varying electricity price, might even be hourly, um, but certainly it's, it's not constant over time. Um, so there you can kind of do what's called arbitrage, which is like a finance word that comes from, you know, stock market or whatever. It basically is buying low and selling high. Uh, so when your electricity price is really high, you discharge your batteries. Uh, when it's really low, you're building, basically you're building. So you let them drift a little bit temperature wise. And then when the price is really high, you basically charge them back up. Um, so actually people, it's it's a simple idea, but it's a little bit more complicated to implement in practice. And not very many people do it, um, but I think more people should. Um, but that stuff that kind of, usually the time scales there on the orders of hours or maybe a day. And so there you can actually get into kind of charging the deeper thermal mass of the buildings. So there you can use the kind of slower time scale battery. Make sense? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so let's wrap up here and then we should have a little bit of time for questions. Um, okay, so just summarizing basically, if we have kind of a two R2C model of a building, which is a pretty good representation of uh, you know most 
at least zones within buildings. Um, we can view it basically as two batteries. One is kind of associated with the air and, and the shallow thermal mass. And here are all the parameters. Just like a normal battery, we have a time constant, we have an energy capacity, we have charging and discharging power capacities. Uh, and then there's another, you know, basically virtual battery associated with, or, or a heat battery associated with the thermal mass. And again, you know, same deal, time constant, energy capacity, power capacities. But I, I do wanna just talk briefly about one last thing, which is the difference basically uh, between thermal batteries and, and electrochemical batteries. Um, so the idea here is that a battery basically takes in electricity at a pretty high efficiency, maybe 95% conversion efficiency, stores it for a long time with very little dissipation, and then gives it back uh, again in the form of electricity. So a round trip in, in a battery uh, would be electric to electric, and it has close to 100%. It may, may be more like a 90 or 95% round trip efficiency, but order one to as a kind of course appro approximation. Um, a heat pump, which again is something we'll talk about on, on Tuesday when we get into heating and cooling equipment. It's basically just a device that uses uh, work, typically electrical work, in order to move heat from uh, a colder place to a warmer place. Um, so anyway, it, it, it takes in, say, one unit of electrical energy, and it would produce as an output thermal energy. So it converts electrical to thermal energy, basically. Um, okay, so here we have this like one-to-one -one conversion with electrical, but with a heat pump, we have this kind of one-to-three conversion. So let me just illustrate what that looks like. Um, so for the power grid, you know, we, we pull, and blue here represents electricity and three, uh, sorry, orange represents heat. So we pull power from the grid, we put it into a battery. Later, we extract that energy from the battery at roughly one-to-one uh, -one conversion efficiency, and we could run it into a heat pump, and then we could provide basically three units of heat to your building. So somehow by storing one unit of electricity in a battery, we get the value of like three units of heat delivered to uh, buildings. Okay, and then suppose we have thermal storage instead of a battery. So now we take the same one unit of energy from power grid, we run it through a heat pump, say, and we store maybe roughly three units of, of thermal energy uh, in some thermal storage thing. And this could be in a building fabric, it could be in you know, what's called an active thermal storage device, uh, in a hot water tank or something like that. And we'll talk more about that in, in a week or so. And then, you know, thermal, thermal storage has some dissipation, but not too much. Um, so setting aside those kind of self-dissipation effects, you basically can extract the same amount of, of heat that you put into it. So you get basically the same heat output and the same electrical input. But the storage that happened here was one unit in the battery, and it was three units in the, the thermal storage. So sometimes you will see like a, a thermal storage company say, uh, thermal storage makes so much economic sense because it's like five times cheaper than batteries. They'll say that 13 and a half kilowatt hour battery that I needed to put in at, your, at my house would cost $13,000. But I could have put in the same amount of thermal storage for you know $4,000, something like that. And that may be true, but what's kind of missing or, or sneaky about that comparison is that um, basically storing electricity has more value than storing um, storing heat. So typically you wanna take the electrical thing and divide it by three uh, to get it kind of a roughly apples to apples comparison between electrical and thermal. So that power wall, if it costs 15 grand, um, you, know, you can think of it as basically like five grand um, for 13 and a half kilowatt hours of thermal storage. So you can still make these comparisons and thermal storage actually in many applications does end up still being cheaper, but rather than like a factor of five cheaper, it might be like a factor of, you know, two or, or less. And then the last point is, is that, um, of course, you can use electricity for things other than heating a building or heating water, right? So in a power outage, if you have a battery in your garage, you shut off your connection to the grid and you can still, you know, charge your laptop and watch Netflix and whatever you want to do. Right, um, but if all you had was heat storage, well, you could stay warm, uh, but you'd be kind of bored, maybe. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, um, so let me wrap there. We've got a couple of minutes left. Um, any questions, kind of about any of the building stuff that we talked about this week? Yes. One question about thermal storage is that it's still kind of wondering about like the dissipation because, like, I imagine with like in either using air or thermal mass. You don't get the full length discharge that way. It just always discharges this. Is that true? Or and then you've always kind of keep it topped up at that temperature. So then when you stop, it'll just sort of dissipate back right here. So so the question is about basically how does energy get discharged from um, 
you know, this kind of passive thermal thermal stores that we're thinking right. about in either the air or the fabric of a building. Um, so does it just kind of discharge all the time or can we like control when it discharges, right? So, um, so let me first say there are two kinds of discharging, right? There's sort of the self dissipation and this is true of a battery as well, right? Um, if you just leave a battery sitting for a long time, for a month or whatever, it'll lose 40% charge or something. Um, so that's one. Uh, and then there's like deliberate dissipation. And so, or de deliberate discharging. So if we think of the, the building fabric, the deep thermal mass as an example. So we charge it by like raising the temperature in this room a couple of degrees that warms up the mass relative to what it would have been in kind of baseline operations. So to discharge it then, we could lower the temperature in the room by, you know, back to the set point, uh, or maybe even by a couple degrees below that. So now maybe the thermal mass is like at 74 Fahrenheit because we held the room at 74 for a long time, but we drop the air to 70, say. And now we've got warmer walls than we have air. And so he starts to bleed back out of the wall and into the air. And the effect that has is essentially to reduce the amount of energy that we have to put into the building to heat the air. So that's kind of a way that we could deliberately discharge the, the passive mass of the building. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So it's um you don't you never get like production of electricity, right? We can never yeah. sell electricity from, you know, generated from the heat on the wall back to the grid, but you get essentially a reduction in, in your demand for electricity, which is similar. Right. Make sense? Yeah. That's a very good question. And these are kind of subtle effects, um, but yeah, anyway, good question. Um, any other questions or, or comments from the room or, or from Zoom? Okay, so uh, in the last minute here, kind of where are we going? You guys have a homework due on Saturday. Create our Sean, our TA will have an office hour on Zoom on Saturday or an hour and a half, something like that. Um, and I'll ask him to basically put that information up on Brightspace, which should send an email blast to you guys. Um, the next homework assignment will be on buildings. And maybe there will be some basically HVAC equipment stuff mixed up into that homework. I'm, I'm not sure, but I'll try to get it out uh, soon so that you can have pretty much all of next week to work on it. Uh, and then where we're going from here, so we're doing HVAC next, so which ties in quite closely with the stuff we did on buildings this week. And then after that, we'll go to um, water heaters and thermal storage, which are very similar, actually quite similar to the material that we wrapped up with today. And then we'll talk about solar panels. Uh, and other kind of solar energy stuff. And uh, and that'll more or less conclude um, the, the DERs that we're gonna study for the semester. So at that point, we'll kind of know most of the physics and how to simulate stuff. And then we'll transition to how to basically make good decisions about how to operate stuff or how to design uh, stuff. Okay, uh, thanks everybody. Have a good weekend and I'll see you on Tuesday. <laughs>